Okay, welcome back. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you once again for being here. Uh, with us at this moment is Miloš Milonovic. He is the lead software architect in Zulke Group. Uh, he works here in Belgrade. He spent the uh, last three years developing different solutions in IoT and, uh, and for cloud. Uh, he will be talking ab uh, about uh, the process between development and uh, going into production and all its complexities. Miloš, take it away. Cool. Okay, guys. So, uh, as I already got an introduction, my name is Miloš. I work for Tsuki Engineering here in Belgrade. And uh, last couple of years, I was fortunate enough to work on IoT and cloud solution most, cl solutions mostly. And uh, so it came into being that we actually got a cool uh, project involving Kubernetes. And I was uh, one of the people working on it. Oh, and by the way, in my heart, I'm still a Java developer. But considering Dave's uh, presentation earlier on, I might want to remove that from my CV. Uh, OK. So uh, first, I know that not everyone here knows what Kubernetes is. And yeah, I need to give you some context what we were exactly doing. So let's first jump into the basics, no more than two slides, so that the guys that are using Kubernetes are not so bored. So what exactly is then Kubernetes? So uh, according to Google, it's an open source platform for running containers across, across clusters of servers, right? So in a nutshell, you have your clusters of servers, right, down there, and you have your applications which you want to run. You're, of course, the developer in this case. So what Kubernetes does is a, it's a glue code, basically, that decides where your applications are going to be placed, depending on the resources you have available. It scales your applications depending on the load you have. It manages replication. So if you want to run some, some of your uh, applications in, for example, five, six, or three replicas, why not? It can provide that to you. And it gives you some level of monitoring. OK, so you don't have to think about those topics. So what resources can you deploy in Kubernetes, actually? So just so you can follow the rest of the presentation, quick explanation. So pod would be like a virtual machine on which you run your Docker containers. Config map would be like a key value store where you would store your configurations, whether they're files or environment variables, whatever you can inject to your containers. Secret is basically the same thing. Then you have deployments. If you want to run a pod and then also tell Kubernetes, hey, manage uh, the state of this thing if it gets killed, spin it back up. And if you want to run it in free replicas, you will always get, for example, free replicas if there are enough resources, of course. You have daemon sets. So in the previous slide, where we had a lot of nodes, daemon set would be an application which is running on each one of your nodes. This is useful for later. And you have stateful sets. If you have applications which require keeping state, you would use these to deploy them. OK, so what does the internet say about Kubernetes? So this is kind of an opinionated uh, set of quotes that I took completely out of the context. But there's one theme here. So it's always stated that, something, that Kubernetes is easy to configure. It's quick and easy to do a deployment. It has a simple little CLI command, which yeah, you can do something with. It's very easy to address scaling. And one can simply add more pods, whatever. So usually, when you read the quote or definition like this, OK, you know, it's easy to do this, but what got more complex? And this is something that I want to talk with you about today. So things that actually got more complicated because it's easy for us to do these things with Kubernetes. So small, in, small intro, what we were actually doing. So customer asked us to create a solution for them. This solution involved, on one side, enabling sets of development teams from different companies, building applications for our customer, managing them through their entire life cycle all the way to production, and in the end, running those applications in the production. So that meant also managing the production environment so that you know, it's stable and users are happy. So in essence, we had two sets of stakeholders. On one side, we had end users. So end users valued security, automatization, you know, the value that the application, that the given application gave them. So end users are our client and our client's clients. They don't care about buzzwords, technologies, and whatever are we using underneath. 
on the developer side, so we have different teams coming from different companies which are building the apps. So they want a stable environment where they can deploy. No hiccups, no, it's a, it's a feature, it's not a bug, you know, no those sentences. So they don't want any additional complexity. So it needs to fit into their workflow if, they want, if uh, you want them to use your solution. Okay, so that's a quick overview of what we were doing. So how we were actually doing CI, CD, and how did we enable the teams to test their applications? So if we go up back to the previous slide, we needed to enable the teams to do a release onto this set of environments. By the way, I forgot to mention what are, what are the environments for. So we, in essence, we were building five clusters aligned into a pipeline where whenever a team developed piece of software which they wanted to deploy, we would fire a pipeline where uh, on the first stage we would run component tests, meaning we would do some testing of the application that that team that has created in isolation. Second testing uh, stage here would be testing in, in, in integration, meaning this would be the first time that teams from different companies got to integrate this software together. Later, teams could move their applications to staging environment, so this is something that they would call release candidate and they would like to uh, release to production. QA teams could work on this environment as well. And in the end, we have a production environment. So another thing that our customer also wanted was to have under control complete source code, so under their control complete source, source code, as well as the build process and release process. So that's why here on the lower end, we chose Azure DevOps as a platform which would be used to build and release the applications. So what's a release process in the context of the teams and how did we fit into this? So a re release is of course a process where any team builds, tests, and runs their application from development to production, right? Of course, you also need to manage the environments where the applications are being deployed. You need to manage the configurations. You need to manage versioning because if you have applications that are developed by different teams, you want to know which set of applications works with which set of applications. Versioning is important. Monitoring, and this is just you know, a handful of things that you need to consider. So how did we solve all of this? So each team got a Azure DevOps workspace where they had their own repositories. All Azure DevOps workspaces were under client subscription. They got their own build pipelines and their environments were configured by us so that they had all the necessary uh, certificates and access rights to push images to the container registry, meaning if they want to do something on their machine and push it, they couldn't. So they really were forced to use Azure DevOps. Once images got to the container registries, we, were, we automatically triggered our release pipelines, which then triggered the test stages. If one test stage failed, of course, you couldn't propagate the image onwards. Good, so what are the challenges then that we faced well, they started with you know, simple things. One, versioning, I mean, why not? Uh, we had quite early on a problem where one team uh, contact us, us and contacted us and told us, hey, we have an application which is completely fine running in production with the latest version from service B, and it's not doing the same thing on testing environment. What's happening? And then you figure out that there are differences in development practices between different teams. So one team just decided to hard code version latest to each one of the Docker images, meaning latest image was running on production, latest image was running on test stage, but they were in fact two completely different pieces of code. Okay, we asked them to you know, make some changes, implement somewhere, whatever. Um, they just hard coded 1.0 once we disallowed uh, latest altogether. So you really need to integrate with the teams and just explain them your issues, let them explain you their issues and work together. Another problem we had was with, we, we like to call them monolith builders, but this is not so exclusive to monolith builders. You know, the guys that build one application 
which was deployed on one place. They had their own test environment. They, they had a name for that test environment. And it was running fine on their environment. They also had access to production. Uh, they were used to having access to production anyway. And they wanted to have access to production because you know, sometimes something fails and they liked using CLI to manage their apps. Of course, you really needed to explain to these guys that access to production is not a good thing. And this is something that we were responsible to manage and not give anybody access to prod. Their release was quite easy, and it was quite easy to integrate this into our Azure DevOps workflow. So, you know, just one build pipeline, that's it. So, solution to everything is usually microservices. That's what people say anyway. So, solution is just move to microservices, everything will be easy. But these guys also had some issues. So, when you talk about microservices, you know, you're splitting, it up, splitting up everything into services. You get this service-oriented architecture. It's been a thing for, for a while. It's nothing new. So one team worries about one service. But again, fine. And complexity here moves to operations. OK, I mean, fine. The problem here is what happens with cascading failures, what happens with networking. Who now worries about this? And if you're in an environment where you have one team developing application and another, one team, another team develop, developing a platform where this is hosted, you get in a whole lot of issues. OK. So yeah, another thing, how to release the microservice. So our Azure DevOps pipelines were quite sufficient here as well. So you release one, and then you release the rest of them. And you know, it's, it's quite easy. So what exactly changed for different teams? On one side, we had monolith builders which wanted to deploy on this platform. Our client bought their services and wants these applications deployed. On the other side, you had microservices which also needed to be deployed. So all teams needed to reorganize to DevOps. Again, DevOps is not a good thing, it's not a new thing. It's been here for a while, and everyone should uh, have their own CI CD pipeline, do automated testing, and all of that stuff. It, this was not accepted well by all of the teams, but they grew to like it. Next thing that most of the teams really enjoyed, so we were building a platform with a bunch of Kubernetes clusters, but we were providing also services to the teams. If you required a MongoDB, we would provide one too. If you required a Redis cache, yeah, sure, we can deploy it in our cluster. If you required messaging queue, sure, you can get it. So they could get services on demand whenever they needed them. So this was kind of a new concept for some of the teams where they could just say, hey, I want to have this. Perfect, you got it. And the others that already were quite used to using cloud solutions, this was you know, quite fine for them. Next thing is automation. So everything needed to be automatic. Our client insisted on it, meaning that if anything happens, we could restore the entire environment. Of course, uh, we had to have CI CD pipelines for everything, so everything needed to be automatically built. And also, another thing that was required was to have a way to roll back to a previous version, for example. You know, if you want to deploy an app and something fails, you always want to have an easy way to go back to a stable state. If a client wants to do header based routing, for, for example, for whatever reason, you need to provide this feature to them. If they wanted to do blue-green deployments or whatnot, yeah, sure, why not? It was our responsibility to be able to provide any of these deployment techniques. Of course, you usually say microservices are the solution for everything, but this platform was kind of built for microservices. And technologies I'm going to talk with you about today, so cover basically this spectrum. Let's jump to the first tech. So how to do release management? So what's, what's the challenge if you want to release your app to a Kubernetes environment? One would be version control. As mentioned, you're deploying an app. Your deployment fails. You want to be able to roll back. You want to know which version is running on which environment. Versioning is important. Next one would be config management. So versioning the app is not the only thing here that's important. 
if you have an app A, so version A, running with certain set of environment variables, and then you redeploy the same version with another set of environment variables, even though it's the same app, those are completely two different releases. And one might work, one might not. Next one would be deployments. So you really need an easy way to do deployment, but without giving too much access to development teams. Preferably, you want to give them everything on mouse click, bam, everything is deployed. So development teams are developing applications, right? When their development finishes, they want to have an easy way to test everything. There's no easier way than just clicking or automatically having something triggered. Rollbacks I already mentioned, sorry. And of course, security, it goes hand in hand with what I just mentioned, not giving too much access at any certain point in time. So release management, let's, let's go through that. I mean, what's, what's the easiest way to manage a release of an application to several different environments? Well, we found this cool tool. It, it's kind of becoming already a standard in Kubernetes world. It's called Helm. And what it does, it's essentially a templating engine which takes some charts, which are configured per environment, fills in the templates, so generates YAML files, which are essentially Kubernetes deployments, sends them to the TLS server, and this thing then contacts the Kubernetes API and creates a deployment. So what you get in the end is, example, a pod of your choice running in the cluster. This kind of, this model is, is perfect, and it also allows us to do rollbacks, because till a server, when they create a deployment, they keep a copy of what they deployed each time. So deployment one was service A with configuration B. Deployment two, service A with configuration C, and so on. There's just one problem with this thing, that's this till a server component. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're using Helm, Till a server has too much rights. It has administrative access to the cluster, and you really don't want to have anything with administrative access running in your production cluster. So solution was just moving till a server out and having something like this. Okay, so I kind of covered how we do releases, the environments which are there for testing, and how do the teams actually manage their own deployments. Let's just now move into techy stuff. So simple thing, logging. I mean, what can be easier than this? But let's, let's think about it this way. So Kubernetes manages placement of your applications. It manages scaling of your apps, right? You have an application which you don't know where it's running. It needs to publish logs, which you need for debugging. And it can scale out, meaning you can have at any point three, five, ten replicas of your application. How do you aggregate your logs in time? So I want to know in which second what is happening with my, my apps. And in front of your application, since they're scaling, of course, you have a load balancer, which you know, distributes requests. So not all requests are going, always going to the same in the instance. Next question would be uh, how to search through those logs. You need to provide an easy way for whoever is debugging the app to get to the logs, how to remove the old logs, where to store them. Should we use an Azure solution or go with our own? So solution here that we went with involves merging a couple of technologies. So this is something known as EFK stack. So what, in essence, what we did. So on one side here, we used a daemon set of a tool called FluentBit. Nice little application, which simply does one thing. Picks up your logs from the nodes, so your servers in the cluster. Uh, quick hint, Kubernetes is uh, logging all standard output to a uh, file on the ro root disk of the machine. So Fluent Bit picks up those, those logs, does some initial passing, so you know, splitting them up by service which generated them and then passes it on to FluentD. FluentD is another cool tool which then does some additional passing. Additional passing might be splitting the logs in time. 
uh, splitting the container, splitting the logs from different containers which are running inside the same pods, sending one set of logs to one Elasticsearch index, setting the uh, other set of logs to the other Elasticsearch index. Mentioning Elasticsearch, we're using Elasticsearch here as a data store for our logs. And in the end, of course, we want to present everything to our users, users being here the developers. So we are running Kibana, which then takes the logs from the Elasticsearch and displays them nicely to the users. Okay, simple solution. And last question, and last point was uh, how to remove old logs. Well, we are running an instance of Elastic Curator, which can then, depending on the environment, remove old logs that are you know, older than seven days or 30 days, depending on the environment. Okay, so you now have your application deployed. What's the state of the app? How do you know what your app is running? How much resources is it using? You're a development team, you're a different company. So we need to provide this information as well to our developers. So first question is what to monitor, how to extract data, how to manage alerts, because if something is going wrong, you want to be the first one to find that out. So should we go with Azure solution again or go with our own? In our case, we again went with our own solution. So solution was based on Prometheus for metrics-based data and having a bunch of different exporters for which then Prometheus scrapes for data. These exporters were picking up different things. So what would you normally use? What would you normally like to see? So you're running cluster service. What's the state of the service? That's important, so that's your first layer. Next, you're running your applications on it. What's the state of the applications? How, many CPU, how much CPU are they using? How much memory are they using? How many threads are they running? If you're running any specific service, and I mentioned that we are providing, for example, MongoDB, Redis, RabbitMQ to the, our end users, we want to know specifics about those applications as well, and we want to allow our users to, sh to send custom metrics also. So simple thing here, just added exposures for whatever we needed, and this is for metrics-based data, send them to Prometheus, and we had Grafana dashboards at the end, which were displaying data to the customers. So what this meant, if you wanted to debug something, so your app is not running correctly. Your app is communicating with app B and with app C. You can go ahead, take a look at the logs, regardless of how many replicas are running at any point in time. You can see what the cluster is doing at any point in time. You can see what your app is doing at any point in time. So that's good enough for debugging, right? Apart from those issues of latency, for example, and if you need to integrate two applications together, for the first time. How do you know if they are communicating correctly? So actually, quick question for everyone. Uh, does anybody know the difference between tracing and logging? So is there a difference? Right, so quick explanation. So tracing is a different thing from logging. Tracing allows you to see which app communicated with which, what, are the, what were the times used, and displays this nicely as a graph, for example. So if I fire a request, and that request took a couple of seconds to do, for example, to MongoDB, I would get you know, a gr nice graph flow which app communicated with which all the way to you know, execution terminates, for example. Okay. So how do you implement then tracing across applications which are done by different teams and in different languages? So we searched around for a bit and found this uh, nice standard called open tracing. It's compatible with most of the common programming languages nowadays. And you can just include a library to your already existing solution. And uh, that would basically it. Oh, it's, it, it's also Zipkin compatible if you're using Java. So what this gives you inside the Jager UI, which is the tool which we were using in the end, and providing it, of course, to all teams, you would see nice workflows, which app is communicating with which, how long did the calls last, uh, what was the payload if teams decide to provide such data. 
Oh, and uh, one more thing. I said this is open tracing is compatible with most programming languages. If it's not compatible with some specific language, it does provide you with documentation how you can modify your headers to use it as well. OK. So we had now a running cluster. So we had a way to deploy the applications to, of course, first build them. We had a way how to provide logs to the teams. Teams could now monitor what their app is doing. We had alerts for ourselves, so we could be the first ones to figure out when something is wrong. We had a tracing allowing the teams to debug their apps. Now let's move to management things. So you're running a Kubernetes cluster. How do you back up the entire cluster? I mean, really back up the entire cluster. You don't you know, redeploy each app one by one. So you had running services, a lot of them, you know, hundreds or thousands, and you needed to back them up at a certain point in time. Oh, and they're running across a cluster of servers, of course. And be able to restore it. Also, what happens if the entire Azure region falls apart? I don't know, there's a huge fire which destroys completely all data, or tsunami, or whatever. So here we found a ready-made solution for one use case, but we had to tweak it a bit to make it work completely to our uh, advantage. So when we started using a backup solution called Arc at first, it was at version zero point something, and it was probably one of the only solutions out there for uh, backing up and restoring a Kubernetes cluster, but only managed Kubernetes cluster hosted in, I think, AWS, Azure, and uh, Google Cloud. So it was later rebranded re as Valero, and currently it's in version one point something, so it's still, still a young technology. So what it does for us, so we have a, a Kubernetes cluster with a bunch of services running. It takes all the definitions of all the deployments we have running in the current cluster, stores them in a storage account in Azure for us. So those compiled YAMLs that I talked about early on, and regarding persistent uh, storage, for example, disk drives, for those, Valero just takes snapshots and store them in the, stores them in the resource group of our choosing, which is quite practical. If at any point we need to restore anything from one service to the entire cluster, we can check, just tell Valero, hey, please restore this service, and you get the data back. Small disadvantage of it, it's, it does take quite a bit of time to do, and another one is it does not allow us to do a re uh, backup into second region or restore from it. So that was the part which we needed to do manually here. Oh, uh, and one more thing. Uh, if you are using such a solution, please make sure that your storage accounts are uh, not uh, locally redundant, but geo-redundant. And if your services, of course, using any sort of storage accounts, they should be geo-redundant. Now, interesting thing about Kubernetes is doing cluster upgrades. It's a young technology, and there's quite a bit of changes between different versions of services. Sorry, between different versions of Kubernetes. So here, the challenge would be how to upgrade Kubernetes version, how to allow system to, we're here talking about the uh, system on the nodes themselves, to update their operating system, and how to allow, for example, for Docker upgrades to take place, which do require a reboot of your uh, servers. Okay, so solution for, there's a couple of solutions for this scenario, but in essence, what's the problem? So if you have node one, which is running you know, seven applications, node two, six, node three, five, if you tr just try hard restarting any of the nodes, what will happen? Your pods will not have where to reschedule. So one solution would be to do it manually. You know, just add another node to your cluster and do a restart. Those pods that were running on this specific node just get rescheduled here. You can just quickly perform a restart. You do really need to uh, keep in mind what's your cluster road at load at any point, because if you want to do this while cluster is under heavy load, you might just crash it. 
next one would be next solution would be to float some resources. So floating resources is you know beneficial if you have varying loads uh, which are burstable. So your application starts using a lot of uh, CPU and memory and then just drops. But on the other hand, if you want to do cluster upgrades and you want to restart any of your services, it's quite easy. So you can just freely restart your node 2 or whatever. Pods get rescheduled, you're fine. Important thing here is if any of these nodes is having a higher load and you restart it, it might not have enough space on another node to run its costs. And this is all well and fine, but then you start digging into documentation and you figure out that bigger cloud operators like AWS and Azure, for those I'm certain, do actually require you, not, not require you, but recommend a different set of upgrade strategy. That would be just cloning your entire cluster and switching your DNS configuration to point to the new cluster. So while previous scenarios which I mentioned are valid use case for running cluster upgrades, do not do it unless you have a good subscription with your cloud provider. With our experiences, we kind of had crashes every second cluster upgrade, upgrade or so. So this is something that both AWS and Azure do recommend. Okay, and last topic I wanted to cover with you guys would be security in such an environment. So with security, I just want to focus on a couple of Kubernetes-specific topics. One would be networking and service mesh. Second one would be access control and how much access should we give to the teams using the clusters. And last but not least, image scanning. So service mesh is a thing also that appeared a couple of years back. There's, I think, two currently big contenders for providing solutions for this. One would be Istio, second one would be Linkert. Again, we were early adopters of, of such a technology you know, a couple of years back already. And, well, not a couple of years, more than a year ago we started using it. And Istio is a nice technology which allows you to configure your layer seven networking. So which, uh, which applications can communicate with which? It does provide you ability to do mutual TLS between different services. If you want to do canary deployments, if you want to do blue-green deployments, you can get these quite easily with Istio. Uh, it allows you to header-based routing and much, much, much more. It's a cool tool and you know it allows you with just one CLI command to control your networking on the application level. So uh, what are the components? So in case of issuing MTLS certificates, you have a Citadel, you have Pilot, which uh, sends configura configurations to the proxies. Each of your pods gets additional container deployed into it. This container is acting as a proxy for all your traffic. And if you need to configure anything, you are using basically a component called Galley. Layer 7 networking, though, might not be enough to con uh, in, in your case. So default policy on layer 3 in Kubernetes is allow all, and Kubernetes does support network policies. What does this mean? Uh, so it means that you can just say uh, from this pod to this pod on network layer, just there's no traffic, okay? And it does this dynamically uh, so it knows where your pods are deployed. So important thing though, network policies in Kubernetes are quite new, so if using them, you need to be aware of a couple of things. So not all network plugins for Kubernetes do support all network policies, and virtually none of them do report what's actually happening in your cluster. So important thing is to test for policies. So once you deploy a policy, test whether it's actually applied. And alternatives do exist because Network policies in Kubernetes are quite a new thing, so Calico started developing uh, previously, I think, two Kubernetes network policies. Last one, image scanning. So image scanning is another new thing. I mean, Docker exists from 2013 or so, and uh, Docker Hub, JFrog Artifactory, and Quay do already have image scanning in place. So if you deploy a uh, so if you push an image to container registry, any one of these, it's automatically scanned for known threats. So it's like an antivirus just going through whatever you're deploying. 
if there is any threat found, sure, it will notify you and just reject the image. Perfect. But what if you have long-running applications inside your cluster? So for example, you have an application which is running for one year. And in the meantime, there was a new high security threat which was detected. None of these would notify you that you have something dangerous running in your cluster. Some of the solutions for that could be you know, using tools like Clear or Anchor. And these tools can provide you the ability to scan selected images whenever you want. So in our case, since we are using a container registry which does not support any image scanning at the moment, we, are, we have configured Anchor to scan all, all of our images on uh, image push, actually, sorry, on image deployment. And we also do have the ability to scan the images continually, though this is currently not implemented fully. So regarding role-based access, how much access should you give to the guys using your environments? So limited access to developers on all environments apart from dev is, of course, a must. Important thing to note that all Kubernetes clusters do have an internal and external API, and service account tokens from the internal API, from the nodes running in your cluster, can be used against your external API, granting any attacker access to your cluster. And last one here is to manage role-based access configurations in the same way you do deployments. Since all, since all the configurations in Kubernetes are, basic, are basically just YAML files, there's no difference in managing your configurations for access as a set of YAML files which you're deploying than to, you know, deployment of a single app. Okay, so what are the takeaways from one year running essentially four production clusters and one dev cluster? So first one would be monitor everything. If an attack anytime comes, you want to be the first one that's notified. If application starts restarting, you want to be the first one to know why. In our case, in, in addition to monitoring system, we also have Slack alerts configured so that everyone gets a message what's happening in the cluster. Next one is that security should be a first cl class citizen. This is something that people tend to forget mostly if you have developers which are just focusing in providing some value, they tend to neglect the security factor of this. And the person that's responsible for the platform solution should be the one that worries about the security. Integrating with the developers of your solution as much as possible. So similar example to, similar to the example I gave about versioning problem we had. So just talking with each other would mitigate a lot of the issues. Important thing is to automate everything, and I really mean here everything. So if at any point you need to restore an entire cluster, you want to be virtually a mouse click away from it. If you want to deploy anything, you want to be a mouse click away from it. But important thing is that you know who has the access rights to click these. Don't get everyone the access. Not actually, so give access to other environments, but to production, definitely not. Regarding production environments, you need to give the tools to developers so that they can do it themselves. This is quite important. No, database access, of course, to the teams whatsoever. This goes without saying in 2019. And we need to make all testing automated. Last one kind of goes uh, is similar to the one to the four points previously. So provide developers with required tools to manage their applications, so that they don't bug you. And I think we have a couple of minutes so for questions. So, any questions? Yeah. If not, I'm going to end my presentation. Thank you for listening. Really? <laughs> yeah, I'll be I'll be around anyway, so you can recognize me easily.